Thank you very much. It's uh, real nice to be here. Appreciate the invitation. I appreciate seeing so many friends and so many individuals here who have uh, helped my efforts in the past. I've had some tough elections in the past, as you know, <laughs> and uh, I only can pursue this uh, adventure with, with uh, help from people like you, so I deeply appreciate that. But I, I certainly want to uh, mention the deep appreciation I have for the Mises Institute because um, I don't think much of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I don't happen to believe the politicians have the solution. The solution is much closer in this room uh, than, it, uh, uh, than it is anyplace else. But, uh, but still, nevertheless, I uh, pursue my efforts in a, in a political way. And uh, I think you probably understand exactly what I'm, tr- I'm trying to do. But, you know, um, I have to confess, though, that since I've been here, I've been rather startled. I met somebody who claims to be an anarchist. Can you believe that? Some of it. Oh, more than one. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, but I want you to know that uh, I feel very special because uh, I'm in government and people actually believe in anarchy. But I want to tell you, I'm, I am here from the government, but let me assure you, I'm here to help you. <laughs> So don't, don't, don't fret, uh, but I feel honored that uh, a group like this uh, would actually invite somebody from the government uh, to come into this room. But, uh, but I do feel very much at home and, uh, of course, take uh, all that uh, the Mises Institute does very seriously because it, it really is a, um, a, a fight for the next generation as well as it is for surviving tomorrow that counts. And uh, so... So we have a long-term uh, approach to this as well as a short-term. So uh, I'm always delighted to, to appear and to participate and encourage what the Mises Institute is doing. I uh, went to college and medical school in the uh, 1950s. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, there, there weren't very many uh, true believers in the free market, in the gold standard, and uh, in libertarian views and strictly limited government, uh, strict constitutionalism uh, had long been gone. So uh, it was uh, at that time where I came across literature, m- much of the literature came out of the Foundation for Economic Education that helped me along the way to get introduced to ideas of Hayek and Mises and, and others. But today I think there's reason to be more optimistic uh, because there are a lot of groups now and a lot of teachers, you've met them here, a lot of professors. And uh, so I think we're doing much, much better. But uh, I wouldn't say that about Washington, D.C. <laughs> the job's not done yet. Don't get complacent because uh, Washington uh, hasn't changed a whole lot. I was there for uh, four terms in the uh, 70s and early 80s, and I was out for 12 years and went back after 12 years and... Uh, Actually, things are, things are worse. I think they're worse. The system is more corrupt. Uh, the struggle for power is more intense. I think the uh, financial situation of this country is worse. Uh, the uh, uh, dollar uh, situation is worse. Uh, the deficits are worse. So in that sense, I think things are a lot worse. But we have more allies uh, than ever before. So I think there's uh, certainly a lot of room for uh, optimism. Uh, just this very week, um, I had the opportunity to visit with uh, an individual that uh, at one time was more or less allied with us, uh, and that's uh, our friend Alan Greenspan, you know, the one that gets to print the money. And uh, he, uh, he comes before the banking committee twice a year, and he, uh, he was before the committee this week, and uh, he is probably going to leave in about a year, so I think there will be only this time and one more time will be the last time I will be, get a chance to ask him a short question that he can evade. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, this week I decided that I would be more confrontational. And uh, so I thought I would uh, try to use some of his own words to indict him. So I decided to use his uh, very well-known article that he wrote in uh, 1967 uh, for Anne Rand's Objectivist Newsletter, which was, uh, I think it was called Golden Economic Freedom. It was a fantastic article. It was good stuff. And uh, 
A few years ago, I didn't do this in public, but I did uh, bring that article up to his attention because we were at a, uh, in a little meeting and we had a chance to get our picture with him and uh, we were talking and, and I just happened to have with me the original copy of the Objectivist newsletter, which was that little green booklet that was faded all yellow by now. And so I opened the page to his article and I said, do you recognize this? And he sort of smiled and says, yes, I, I recognize that. And I said, I'd like to get your autograph on this. <laughs> so he took out his pen and he, he gave me an autograph. And as he was signing, I said, do you want to put a disclaimer uh, on this article? And he said, no. He says, I read it recently and I, I endorse every word. Uh, he says, I agree with every word that's in there. I wouldn't change anything. So I thought maybe uh, he would be more uh, ready to uh, open up a little bit about gold. So this week when I asked him about it, he was not quite as friendly uh, about it because he, his answer this time was uh, when I was using his words against him. He said, well, that was 40 years ago. He says, my views have changed. And, uh, and, he, said, and he said something that his projections back then and his concerns uh, didn't pan out. They weren't, uh, it, it didn't work out the way he had expected. So I really wanted my next 30 seconds, which I couldn't get, because I wanted to ask him, what about today's projections, whether they'd be any better? But uh, I didn't get to do that. But in, in essence, what I asked him was um, the, the uh, idea, well, he has told me before that paper money, that central bankers are so smart, he didn't, I'm paraphrasing, central bankers are smart enough today to make go- paper money act as if it were gold. And therefore, the adjustments and everything uh, are, are essentially like gold. And of course, uh, anybody who has an understanding of the gold standard would disagree. And I pointed this out. I said, for instance, uh, I said the current account deficit probably would be handled quite differently under a gold standard. The adjustments would occur more automatically and, and much uh, quicker. And we wouldn't have artificially fixed exchange rates, say, between the renminbi and the dollar and uh, also the, the fact that uh, uh, the, the price inflation, which they like to quote, uh, uh, has not been held in check as well as gold would. Be, but, uh, of course, government statistics, his CPI, he's claiming, oh, look, we've licked inflation. Uh, and I pointed out, well, I thought there was still a little bit of inflation left. Uh, so I mentioned uh, 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 medical, medical costs, educational costs, cost of buying a, uh, a bond, uh, and also, I said, I think housing prices are going up a little bit. And, um, and then the housing prices not only go up, but they, uh, they push up our property values and our taxes go up. I said, you don't even count that in the CPI. And of course they don't, they just ignore that. So I was arguing a case, and I, I think I got vindicated rather quickly on that because the next day, this week, we saw that the PPI was going up at a 0.8%, uh, at, you know, at the core rate. So obviously, I think in a group like this, we all know that there's still a lot of price inflation. There's a lot of basic monetary inflation out there and a lot of problems. But the issue that I really wanted to hit him on is that uh, I conceded to him that he's been very consistent over the years. He always says, you know, if we have a problem, it's your fault because you're the Congress and you spend too much money. Cut down the deficit. That's what we ought to do. And I said, I try to do my share. I don't vote for any of it. I said, but I said, I think you're part of the problem as well. Uh, You're part of the problem because if we, the Congress, spend the money and we run up a deficit, we print a bond and you buy it. You buy the bond with credit you create out of thin air. I said, so you're part of the trouble. It's this whole system. And this is more or less what he was saying in that article. He recognized this, that under a gold standard, uh, this is preventable. But he was rather adamant with me there that... uh, that uh, he does not participate, and his Federal Reserve does not participate in, in any of this uh, deficit financing. Now, the interesting thing is, is the chairman of, of the banking committee, which is called Financial Services, uh, is not going to give me any extra time. And he is pretty strict on the time, but I always gauge it where I'm not going to ask a 30-second question because I won't get any more time because it will be used up in the answer. But this time I used about three and a half minutes, and Greenspan had... One and a half minutes, he was well into his answer. And it's the first time I've ever seen it happen. The chairman 
with Greenspan speaking, gaveled him down. He says, the time of the gentleman has expired. <laughs> Usually the person down there answering the question gets as much time as he wants to answer it. But he wasn't much interested in, in hearing any part of, of this discussion. So that's a little bit of entertainment. That doesn't solve uh, much of our problems, but uh, uh, it, it's something that makes it entertaining for me, at least, to put up with what, what uh, I have to do in Washington. But a lot of people ask me, aren't you, you know, pretty darn frustrated with this? You, you know, you've been beating your brains against a wall on, on this and nothing really seems to happen. The deficit goes up and, and, and all these problems. And I said, you know, the real truth is, is I am not uh, frustrated. And I simply go there with low expectations. I, I, I just don't expect that I'm going to change the world. And I don't have the expectations that I'm going to be a committee chairman because I won't be. That's, that's the way it works because you have to, you have to sell your soul and sell your votes and, and buy votes and, and uh, do whatever they want in order to participate in that. So that's, that's not my goal either. My goal has been first to run for Congress with a set of beliefs that the people would endorse. And then after there, don't hide behind them, but vote that way express them and spread the message of exactly what I'm trying to do and just see if there is a district in this country that would actually know what you're doing and re-elect you. And that's, that's my goal. Not me personally to have a seat in Congress, but to have yours and my views expressed and voted for and be made real and then actually get a congressional district uh, to endorse this. And so far... So good. You know, I had four terms early on. I've been back there. I had uh, uh, three terms. The last election was the uh, uh, fourth term, and uh, I um, uh, kept going up on my on my percentages. You know, it was 51 percent, 54 percent, 61 percent, and then this last go around, uh, after re- uh, the second redistricting, they uh, they gave me a district which was the weakest Republican district in Texas. And uh, meant to be that I wouldn't lose, but I'd have to work at it. But lo and behold, an interesting thing happened on the way to the polls. Um, everybody else in Texas had an opponent except me. <laughs> so it, Democrats and Republicans all had somebody. They didn't have major opponents. But uh, So I hope that's a message. I hope the message that we have of liberty does appeal to Republicans, does appeal to some Democrats, does appeal to some independents, does appeal to the libertarians and uh, to the strict constitutionalists. I'm not sure that's a perfect answer because there are rumors that, you know, there will be somebody. Watch out. Watch out for your next primary. So uh, if if I want to keep doing this, I have to stay alert because... uh, the biggest noise I get are coming from those who are diehard uh, Bush supporters. And uh, they, they will call and they say, why aren't you supporting the president? And I explain to them the issue and tell them what I believe in, what I've said, what my position's been, what the Constitution says, what our platform says. And all this is good defense. And uh, they say, that's beside the point. I want you to support the president. And, of course, the answer that I give them then is that, uh, well, why have me here? I mean, why don't you just send somebody here with a rubber stamp and, and do whatever he says? I mean, if you have true representation, you want somebody there to at least read the bills and know what they're doing and think for themselves. And, uh, he, and, and this, um, this, this is not frequent, but it's usually minimal and it usually comes from the very, very uh, diehard Republicans. But uh, I am convinced from my experience of many years of doing this that our philosophy can be and is popular. For some reason, it hasn't been translated into having a lot of allies in Washington. But if you go about the countryside, if you go about uh, uh, just talking to your friends and neighbors, you say, well, they're ignorant and they don't know anything, they haven't studied this, they don't know Austrian economics. But if you talk to them uh, and say, well, do you believe in the free enterprise system and, and you know, free markets and load? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Do you believe that uh, the government ought to stay out of our bedrooms? Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And then you ask them, do you think we ought to be the policemen of the world? And they say, obviously we shouldn't be the policemen of the world. That was the campaign slogan of George Bush in 2000. <laughs> you know, but uh, lo and behold, uh, the people, I think, if they know about it and have a chance, they will endorse our views. But all of a sudden, 
Somebody's guard is left down because we end up with those same individuals who have advocated those positions and they go to Washington. All of a sudden, they're voting spending like crazy and they're intervening like crazy. They militarize the world and they promote all the international government. So what seems to come out of Washington is complete contradiction to, I think, what the people would accept and will, uh, would vote for if it's offered to them because it's been offered to them. I think the real job is how do we keep their feet to the fire because uh, too often we get careless and uh, the politicians get away with uh, uh, way too much. You know, there is a, a recent piece of legislation passed um, dealing with the uh, FCC uh, on, on indecency. You know, uh, after that, a year ago when they had that obscenity on TV, and I guess it was during the uh, Super Bowl, uh, I don't happen to watch Super Bowl, so I, I didn't get to see it. But <laughs> but anyway, Congress had to do something about that. And uh, they passed the law, but they brought the law up again. And this time, penalty for obscenities on television and radio will be $500,000. And uh, last year, when we had to vote, I voted against it. Because, you know, it wasn't a complicated issue. Because if you can read, and I do take an oath of office, uh, sorry you anarchists, I still take the oath of office, I say I'll uphold the Constitution. But if you can read, what does the Constitution say? In the First Amendment, it said, Congress shall write no law. And I said to my colleagues, why are you writing these laws you're not supposed to? Well, well the government owns the airway, so we're responsible and we have to do it. Now, you have to realize my district is uh, South, South Texas. I had 22 counties at the time, very rural, very conservative. It's called Bible Belt. So, you know, I have a challenge to present my views because I'd get rid of all the federal drug laws. You know, that's a bit of a challenge. So what do you do? You're not going to you're not going to throw these people in jail for using bad language on television. What if don't you care about your kids? So I voted no. And I think I was the only Republican. It caught the attention of a national figure. And he thought he'd help me out. So he gets on his radio program and starts bragging about me. And I said, holy man, this Howard Stern is not helping me one bit. <laughs> he doesn't need to be doing this for me. <laughs> so, uh, but the vote, the vote came up again, and of course it was overwhelmingly uh, supported. But the principle's bad. You know, we don't solve those kind of problems, but we could privatize the airways in a true sense. And we could teach people to turn their TVs and radios off, and a few other things could solve those problems. But uh, in Congress, you know, they take the uh, principle, Congress shall write a law. And if Congress doesn't write the law, we'll let the courts write the laws. So uh, they're in the law-writing business, and believe me, they uh, do their job quite well. They write a lot of laws. We'd like to get them out of that. I'd like to have a moratorium on laws for a long time. You know, unless you repeal something. Now, that would be a pretty good start. Just The only thing that we could do, say, for five or ten years is the only thing we can do to improve the country is repeal. And uh, that, uh, that, to me, would be the best thing. My legislation is easy to understand. It's usually one page or one paragraph because it's along the lines of repealing. Now, on the other side, it's very complex. You can't understand it. and You don't even get to read it. The Patriot Act, this huge, horrible bill that undermines our liberties, came to us one hour before the debate started. And it came and it was difficult to find on the Internet. There was not one single soul that could have uh, uh, read it because most of them couldn't even found it. And yet they were required. But the only thing is, oh, the people want us to do something. Let's do it. And they vote for it. And this, is, this came up again this last week. I mean, we've had quite a few. Uh, it, uh, liberty has not been served well since 9-11, in case you haven't noticed. But uh, this week, once again, uh, we've had, uh, you know, so many of the laws already passed with Homeland Security and Patriot Act and other things. But uh, this week it had to do uh, with the uh, national ID card. And, of course, the, those who are promoting it would never call it a national ID card. You know, if, if we had a bill on the House floor and said national ID card, uh, it wouldn't pass. Nobody would vote for it. But this was a bill to, um, to standardize uh, federal standards for all driver's licenses. Oh, that's okay, because we're going to catch the bad guys. We're going to, catch, uh, uh, we're going to be able to catch the terrorists, uh, and on and on. 
Well, that was a t- <clears throat> that was not a tough vote for me, but it was a uh, vote that will uh, be noticeable because uh, there was only one Republican that voted against that as well because it was overwhelmingly uh, uh, supported. And this, to me, is you know, is for all the bad things we have done, this one was really bad. I mean, it, not as the card will come out, it won't be horrible right away because they will be standardized. Uh, uh, requirements for all the states to follow it. But they argued with me and they said, but it's voluntary. Yeah, sure, it's voluntary. You know how it's voluntary. But so if the state doesn't do it and doesn't go along with it, anybody that lives in that state can't get on an airplane. You know, that, that sort of thing. So it, it's, it's just a farce that it was not standardized. Uh, but the real bad part about w- that bill was that the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security was given Unlimited license to put anything he wants on that ID card. I mean, if you happen to belong to a gun group or a right to life group or who knows what, they can put that information on there. And uh, also that the courts could not review the law. They wrote in the legislation that this would the courts could never review this for constitutional muster. So uh, those that open endedness was very bad. Right before the vote, and I was getting ready to give my talk. One of the more senior Republicans came in, and he was uh, going to take, he can bump me and take the time. And he sat down, he says, Ron, uh, and we're friendly. And he says, I, he says I've decided you go ahead first because I want to hear what you're going to say. And we got to talking, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, you have libertarian leanings, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I have libertarian leanings. And then he sat there and agreed with me that just what I got done telling you, he says, yeah, those are the bad parts of the bill. And then he gets up and praises the bill and votes for the bill and pushes the bill through. But he acknowledged these problems that this thing could be open-ended. The part that I fear the most on this national ID card is, is this technology. I love technology. It's great. And uh, we benefit. And technology is helping us fight our, our battles. But this technology that has already been put into the passports is this, uh, is, is this radio frequency ID where they don't even, in, you, I told them on the floor, I said, you don't, we won't have the old cliche of saying take out and show your papers. All you have to do is walk by some scanner and they'll be able to find everything out about you without you even taking your wallet out of your pocket because they can read what is on your, uh, on your passport. That's not going to be on uh, your driver's license now, but who knows in a year or two. What, what if the other party gets in power. They might abuse our liberties if the other party uh, gets in power. So we have to be careful. We never know uh, who's going to be in charge. So uh, I think that's something that uh, hopefully that hasn't passed uh, the Senate yet, and I'm hoping that uh, that that can be stopped. You know, each um, each time we have a break, and, and we have a break now because next week... Uh, we have to go. Is Tom DiLorenzo still here? Is, uh, we have to next week celebrate uh, Lincoln's birthday. So we get a special time off for Lincoln's birthday and others. And uh, on breaks, the Republican leadership sends a brochure around, you know, a notebook on our marching orders, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to coordinate the, uh, uh, the propaganda. So uh, it's... It's, uh, it's, to me, insulting, and, of course, uh, I have to turn that around, so I read it, and I find it's entertaining. Um, and the marching orders this week uh, was to, we were supposed to emphasize two things. First, the benefits of that ID card, because we're going to make you safer and secure and make sure that you uh, agree with this, and that, that was a job we had, because maybe there's some doubtful people out there. And the... The other thing we were supposed to do was to go into our districts and explain to them that the Republicans aren't cheap, that they do fund the good programs, that we have increased benefits for education and benefits for, ben- uh, for medicine and benefits to, for Homeland Security, on and on. And we were to reassure everybody. At the same time, we were to explain to them that uh, we're going to hold the line. On the discretionary spending, we're going to cut it 1%. And everybody's going to be happy. 
So that, that is the mentality, as if the 1% would make a difference, as if the 1% would get passed. And then the very next day after they put the budget in, or the next week, they bring in the supplemental budget, which is not even mentioned in the budget, which is going to be $80, $82 billion. But there'll be good things in there, and it's growing. It was 78 80 now it's 82 and, uh, you know, it makes it awful tempting. I mean, there's, there's $780 million in there to build uh, a palace in Baghdad for our embassy, you know, our, our ambassador over there. So you wouldn't want to you wouldn't lo- lo- want to look cheap over there. So uh, it looks like they're going to get uh, another palace. I I thought they might have been able to use some of those old ones that they took over, but uh, I guess they're using those for prisoners right now or something else. But but uh, that that's the kind of stuff that's in there. And so uh, don't don't expect any fiscal responsibility coming out of this Congress. I mean, if, if you think fiscal irresponsibility has something to do with putting pressure on the Fed to print money and, and ignore the uh, constraints that a gold standard would be uh, put on, on uh, uh, inflation, you can expect that uh, this is going to continue. It's not going to go away, and I'm afraid it can get much, much bigger. Uh, just in the last 12 months, the national debt went six, up 664 billion dollars, much higher than what they call the national debt. So that's the obligation, and that is, doesn't include all the obligation. So it's, a, it's a, in a way a minor miracle that uh, so much can be uh, accomplished in spite of what the government is doing to us. But someday this is all going to, to uh, catch up to us, and uh, then, uh, then I think that we will see a financial and a monetary crisis of a, of a serious uh, nature. One other bill I want to mention I worked on that I think also is a, a major threat uh, uh, to us uh, because of the nature of it. And that has to do with compulsory mental health screening for every child in public school. Compulsory screening without permission of the parent. And uh, lo and behold, this came out of a commission that was also associated with drug companies and they believe that it is in the best interest of young people that they make sure that we not have anybody drop through the cracks and if they happen to need more drugs, uh, you know, here we have this war on drugs. They're going to stop the use of illegal or, or uh, recreation drugs. At the same time, our government is spending all this money in cahoots with the drug companies to pump more drugs into our kids. And... Uh, this one, I think, we're gaining some momentum. Uh, we weren't able to stop it. There was uh, $20 million allotted for that last year, and there'll be more this year. It's an early start. It'll be into the hundreds of millions. But they, they not only want to test every kid, they want to test everybody in, uh, all the adults involved in education. But I imagine there'll be a day when somebody will say that every adult in this country ought to be tested for mental health uh, screening. But, we all know the stories of what it was like uh, under the uh, under the Nazis and under the communists. Uh, I mean, this whole tool that uh, you know you you need to be uh, uh, re- rehabilitated in a mental hospital if you happen to d- disagree uh, politically. So that's the kind of thing that is on the horizon, maybe in a distance, but it's still a danger. I think it's just a, a horrible notion. But this starts with the fact that what in thunder is the federal government involved in federal education at all anyway? That's what I think is a horror. You know, um, George Bush ran on a program of uh, no nation building, and he thought we should not be involved. And one of the reasons why uh, our foreign policy can be pursued in the type of policy we have today, of course, is because they have a printing press. We as a people, not just the Congress and not just the courts, but the people in this country have permitted our government to get away with the notion that money can come out of a, of a paper mill, that we can create it out of thin air. So it's our fault as much as anybody's. And... Uh, this allows them to have runaway spending domestically, but it also permits the runaway spending internationally and to pursue international uh, events that they shouldn't be, and that is pursuit of war. Even when we were on a token gold standard or a gold standard uh, during wartime, they suspended it. So gold is not a panacea. Gold itself, if we followed it, it would. 
But uh, gold itself cannot prevent that from happening. I remember a, a debate I had once with Milton Friedman. And one of his arguments against the gold span, standard was governments didn't stick to the rules. They would just, when they needed to, they quit following the gold standard. And, and he's right about that. But how could we trust them more so to print money <laughs> less, you know, uh, at a certain rate or not at all? So that argument I don't think has any weight. The important thing is that gold be permitted to be legal. That is pretty important. So in a way, we have a pseudo gold standard. Because today, if you don't like your greenbacks in your pocket and your, and your credit and you get a little bit worried, at least we have the legal right, which we didn't have for quite a few years, several decades, where you couldn't even go out and, and buy gold. So we are. We are uh, on it. Even though that market gets fudged around and manipulated, which I believe they do, it's still available. And, uh, and, and, and this means that there is a token uh, uh, ability for the marketplace to, to restrain uh, this uh, wild, wild spending. But anyway, the monetary system certainly goes a long way to helping to run this foreign policy which uh, George Bush campaigned against. And I think that we should be deeply concerned about what's happening. Uh, there are great threats around the world, and the expansion of that war as I see it, is almost uh, absolutely determined how we're going to get out of there without expansion. There is no way they're going to walk away from Iraq, and there is no way won't, they won't retaliate once there's another accident over there. And they're trying to precipitate an accident, whether it's in Syria or Iran, uh, and that's when, that's when it's going to expand. The limitation, though, eventually will be fiscal. Uh, the inability of the Soviets to finance their wicked system came to an end. But it wasn't because we built more weapons than they did. I mean, it just, their whole system just collapsed because it wasn't functional. And ours won't be either. Our, our system can't function uh, under, uh, under the current strain if it continues much longer. So we, as a group of people, especially a group like this, we have an obligation to ourselves and to our families, but if we care about the country that we live in and, and, the, and the values that we've had here, we should do whatever we can to pass this information around so that if it does happen, we don't get something a lot worse. And uh, if we allow those individuals to continue to be in charge in Washington and we have a crisis, a major crisis, believe me, don't feel comfortable. Uh, but I think we're gaining, like I said before, we are gaining and we're moving in the direction of a lot more people uh, understanding exactly uh, what's, what's going on. Um, you know, there's a, um, there was a pamphlet, small booklet, an article written uh, many years ago that I, uh, I want to refer to, and that was uh, written by Randolph uh, Bourne. And I think most of you... Mu- uh, many of you might not remember the name, but I think you'll remember the title of, uh, uh, of his essay, and it was uh, War is the Health of the State. And, um, and this is something I deeply believe. You know, in, re- in, in reading that article, it's interesting how he takes uh, a, 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 and describes the difference between the country and the people versus the state, and he actually puts government into a different category. And uh, the, the government is more of the mechanics of what's going on, but the state is mystical, and it, is, uh, it, it represents uh, uh, a, a strong belief of a special class of people, an elite class of people. And he said that war is controlled by this elite class of people, not the, not the masses. And, and they do this, and he had an interesting quote there, which I think uh, fits into something that's happened rather recently. And he said that uh, war can be called an upper-class sport. And uh, I think that's a pretty good analysis. Not only internationally do in these, these fights that go on for various reasons, and there are various reasons why we're in Iraq, but also domestically, you know, the vying for power and prestige and control is a sport in Washington. There's no difference between Republicans and Democrats. We know that. You know, even if you believed or wanted to think that we could have a Democratic election, how can you have a Democratic election if you have one party? That doesn't make any sense. So there's a sport up there, and the sport is who's going to hold the power. So 
There's no difference in belief. You know, whether you have uh, uh, Bill Clinton in there bombing the Iraqis because he wants to distract from his impeachments, or whether you have George Bush doing it to uh, satisfy uh, some other group. But uh, it's, it's the power struggle that's, that goes on. It's intense. It's serious. So, yes, there is a difference between Republicans and Democrats. Who's going to control the power? And they have their own little inner circle, so there's, uh, there's competition. So it, it's uh, like a sport. But I think something... Now, you have to remember, Bourne wrote that in 1918. And the sad part about Bourne was that he died at the age of 32. He was a young man. He went through the war... And, uh, and, and end up getting the flu and, and died from the flu epidemic. So he never even got to finish that, that particular essay. But even the short essay is really worth uh, looking at and reading because there's a lot of uh, psychology that he writes about and what uh, moves the people. But uh, I think most of you heard this uh, statement made. It was on the news that I think confirms Bourne's uh, idea that uh, war is a sport. And this comes from this uh, uh, Lieutenant General uh, John Math- Mattis. He says, uh, this is sick. This is really sick. Actually, it's a lot of fun to fight. You know, it's a hell of a hoot. It's fun to shoot some people. I'll be right up front with you. I like brawling. You go into Afghanistan. You've got guys who slapped women around for five years because they didn't wear a veil. You know, guys like that ain't got no manhood left anyway. So it's a hell of a lot of fun to shoot them. Now, that, you know, let's hope that is an absolute isolated incident. But in a, in a more general and broad way, though, he is reflecting a lot of what goes on for the elite class for various reasons, whether it's for uh, commercial interests, military industrial interests, banking interests, territorial interests, oil interests, uh, Zionist interests, all these things, and they come together. Or maybe even the worst is that uh, it's their game that they're playing because they feel this moral, religious obligation to spread goodwill, spread democracy, uh, Wilsonianism, make the world safe for democracy. And therefore, they are doing these wonderful things. So that is, it's, it's all mixed up in, in these motivations. But the real sad part comes from us, the people who put up with this. Pay the bills and let them inflate the money and taxes. And uh, it just goes on and on. You know, Tom uh, DiLorenzo was in my office the other day, a few members, and he talked about the Civil War. And one member who had, is pretty hawkish and was, uh, had voted for the war, and um, he, he kept asking Tom, he says, he says to him, he says, how could they ever get those northern kids to have the energy and determination to march in the south and fight like this and kill and kill and kill? What, what was their motivation? Some said, well, the motivation for the Southern was to defend their homeland. And, and the other side was it was a bit of this uh, super patriotism and uh, a little bit of coercion and, and a few other things that they pump them up and they feel like it's uh, uh, their patriotic duty to, to go off and fight. So I looked to the, the, the fellow that was making this point. Uh, I said, you know, it's sort of, he was concerned about the Civil War, but it's sort of like what they're doing today. I mean, this is, this is why they go and fight, and this is why people support the war. And this is the number one issue, if I have a Republican challenge me, it's on, on the issue of war. Why don't you support the president and support the war and support the troops? I'd like to support the troops. I'd bring them all home tomorrow if I could. You know, uh, in dealing with the subject of uh, what our obligations are and what we can do, um, I want to um, quote something from uh, a long time ago. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention was uh, in another conference down the hall, there was a young man there and he uh, spotted me and came over. He happened to uh, uh, recognize me, uh, but he wasn't with this conference. And he, he, was, he was disturbed because what can we do and what should we do? And, you know, the exasperation and the frustration uh, of, of all that's going on. And uh, I want to address that, and I might go about two minutes overdue if, if it's okay uh, to, do, to do this. But I want to quote from something that happened in, uh, in Roman times. Uh, 
we all know that Cicero fought a great fight to try to preserve the Republic uh, of Rome. And uh, in 70 B.C., Cicero was a rather young man, and he had uh, been studying law. And he was out on his first, uh, first case to defend. And um, he, it wasn't going well, and he was defending a businessman who was un, being unfairly challenged. And uh, it was just an abuse of his liberties and, and abuse of all the rights that he was supposed to have under, under, under the Roman Empire or the Roman Republic. And uh, so Cicero was absolutely frustrated because he, he, uh, it looked like he was going to lose his case. So he goes to his teacher. And uh, Scavola it was the teacher's name. And he got a rather surprising answer. Uh, no, no soft uh, support uh, for Cicero. He said to Cicero, he says, Imbecile, of what use are records presented to tribunes, councils, or senators if the government is determined to rob and destroy a man who has displeased them or who possesses what they want? Have I truly wasted all these years on such an idiot as this Marcus Tullius Cicero? So the message there is, you know, how can you fight this fight within the system? And I ask myself, you know, am I, am I doing the same thing? Am I over there beating my head against the wall for this very same reason? Because they're not going to listen to logic. They're not going to listen and, uh, and, and respond. Uh, and I see this daily on the problems that are brought to me by the, by the bureaucrats, you know, in our government, trying to take, you know, whether it's an eminent domain problem or some type of regulation or some horrible regulation on imports. There's all kinds of things that people come to and are just being harassed to death uh, uh, by our government. But uh, are we, if we work in Washington like myself, are we just... Uh, just being frustrated in the sense that uh, we're dealing it, with it by pretending that they're going to listen to us. And um, my answer to that would be that I think that if, if we think only working through the agencies of government and hiring a real good lobbyist is going to solve our problems and not deal with the principle, I think that would be the case. I don't go there with the intention and the pretense and belief that I can change things tomorrow. Uh, Joe Becker is here, and I reminded him, and many times I believe, I am not a legislator. I do not come here to legislate. I come here for different reasons. I do propose legislation, but it isn't to tinker. I never want to tinker with legislation. I always want to deal with the broad picture of non-intervention, sound money, uh, limited government following the rule of law, and not to say that I have a minor victory, because if you get a minor victory and you get a, a cut of a funding by a couple million dollars, and then you vote for the bill, you've still endorsed the whole principle. So uh, I think there, there's a difference if you work within the system and you think you're going to solve it. Ultimately, though, tinkering, I think we do that out of self-defense, but ultimately the answer has to come with our beliefs and our convictions our beliefs and our convictions of another generation, including whatever we can do, our obligations to ourselves and to our families, our friends and our churches and our communities, to band together and to uh, know what we believe in and, and to be country and to be community, but not to be government and not to be state. I think if those are the goals, if we think we can clean the state up or clean up the monetary system, uh, the, the, uh, the monetary system alone will, will not do it. Often I thought the Cicero uh, quote also applies to my approach to the war. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Randolph Bourne pointed this out. He says, even when there are laws against going to war and you have to have legislative approval, they never work. And he was, you know, writing a, a recent history because whether it was, uh, he would have remembered uh, the Spanish-American War and World War I. Because the executive branch have too much power. They come in and they drum beat, uh, beat the drums of war and the executive branches or the legislative branches uh, uh, go, uh, go along. So that makes me think, well, you know, when I was, uh, when the resolution came before our committee, uh, I made them vote on a declaration of war. 
more or less to show them what kind of hypocrites they were. They were going to war, but they didn't want to say they were going to war. They wanted to say to the president, you can go to war if you want. The fact that we have been given responsibility not to, to uh, decide whether or not, we don't want that responsibility. So I used that, if I thought they were going to vote against the war, or that war wouldn't happen, that I think would have been very foolish. But hopefully there was a message to somebody, someplace, that said that where, why is it that the Congress has given up so much of their prerogatives, have given so much, respond, uh, so much power, once again, to the executive branch of government? And uh, that is why, of course, we have a tremendous job uh, before us. I want to uh, close with a quote from, uh, from the uh, famous economist uh, Ludwig von Mises, and this is a quote I've used before. You probably have heard me use it. But I think it's really applicable to, to what I do. And to you as well, but in a, in a different sense. And that has to do with, uh, with our responsibilities. And he said the flowering of human society depends on two factors. The intellectual power of outstanding men to conceive so sound social and economic theories. And we certainly have plenty of, of those individuals and men and women here today. And the ability of these and other men to make these ideologies palatable to the majority. That's what we have to do. We have to make them acceptable. Make them acceptable to the point where they believe it's in their self-interest that the less government they have, the better off they are. The better off we would be internationally, the less wars that would be fought, the less economic turmoil we have, the less business cycles we would have, the less inflations we would have, and the more personal liberties and personal satisfaction. Our goals ought to be designed, our efforts, my efforts at least, are designed for one thing, to promote liberty, promote the cause of, of individual liberty. So that is what our effort should be. Believe in very sincerely that people then have the responsibility upon themselves uh, to promote their own virtue and to promote their own excellence, to promote uh, whatever they need to promote their spiritual and their material life. And it's up to them, not the government. We now live in an age where that responsibility has been endlessly given to the government and the government has this responsibility to take care of us economically and physically and medically and educationally. And uh, government can do it only. They can make an effort. They can't do it. They can only make an effort to do it by undermining liberty. So they're absolutely inconsistent. So if we believe in uh, prosperity and self-reliance and and, uh, and, and people working for the things they like and, and family values and virtue and excellence. There's only one answer to that, and that is liberty. And that is to get the government off our backs and out of our pockets and out of our lives. And for that cause, I stand here with you. Thank you very much.